Well, thank you, Tony, for that excellent introduction. Uh, <coughs> amazing that we went to the same school, and as you say, <laughs> must be something in the water. We always used to think they put bromide in the water. <laughs> anyway, never mind. Um, you were expecting a talk on the mayor and the Mayan calendars. Well, that is only going to be part of what we're going to talk about. It's going to be in a wider context. But this is a unique talk. I've never given this before. So I hope you're going to enjoy it. And you will find it food for thought when you're considering your electric universe ideas as well. Um, you mentioned the Orion Mystery. This is probably the book I'm most famous for, which I co-authored with Robert Bovell uh, in 1994. It was turned into a, a BBC documentary called The Great Pyramid Gateway to the Stars, which was hugely successful. Uh, Came at, the documentary came out at the same time as the book, which, you know, not surprisingly, went to number one. So we had, we had a number one bestseller between us, which was quite amazing, especially in this kind of field. Because mostly, if you want to write a bestseller, it's got to be a biography about someone or something about the Kardashians or something like that. And to get a bestseller out of talking about pyramids and stars was something quite special. Uh, Anyway, the, the basic idea in this book is to do with the Pyramids of Giza. And here's a, an overhead picture of the pyramids. You can see that's the Great Pyramid there. That's the Pyramid of Khafre or Kefren. And here's the smaller Pyramid of Mycerinus. And you might be thinking, well, so what? Well, those are the stars of Orion's belt. And if I do that, mm -hmm. you can see you have a di this is This is the core of the book. Yeah? It was actually two pictures. <laughs> but there's a lot more other backing up evidence to go with them. But you can see here the basic concept. You've got two big pyramids with one smaller one, which is offset. And then you've got two bright stars, Al Nitak and Al Nilam, and a, another star not quite as bright, offset. And the, the, the basic idea in the Orion mystery was that the Egyptians, for whatever reason, built their pyramids to represent the stars of Orion's belt. And it did more than that. They had these peculiar air shafts coming out from the pyramids, uh, of the Great Pyramid anyway, from the, ki the king's chamber here. There's a star that, that culminated uh, at the culmination point in the south of Orion's belt. This was discovered in 1964 by <coughs> a lady called Virginia Trimble, who was then post-grad <coughs> astronomy, um, not a, you're not a student, I suppose, if you're post-grad, working in Egypt. She's now a senior professor of astronomy. I think it's either Maryland or one of the other big uh, universities in the USA. Anyway, she discovered that this shaft was actually pointing at the culmination of Orion's belt, and this shaft on the other side was pointing directly at what was then the North Star, a star called Thuban, in the constellation of Draco. Very interesting, especially when you think about these pyramids representing Orion's belt. And then when you go to the papyri, I'm sorry, I'm, I could show you a hundred different slides to do with this, and I'm having to give you a potted version, because this isn't actually the depth of what we're going to go into. But if we look at the Papyrus of Arni, which is one of the most famous papyri in the British Museum, it's uh, commonly called the Book of the Dead. And it shows you, what he says is, I opened the door in heaven. And this door is, you've got a star here, and you've got this eagle, the eagle has the sound of ah, and the, the hieroglyph of a star is, is pronounced sba. So they're telling you that it, it's, it's sba, and it shows you also that there is this figure here which shows a chamber with an entrance to it. So this actually means a door, and it's a door with a star. So I call it a stargate. That's how I came up with this term, the Stargate. And you'll learn a little bit more about what this Stargate is all about. It says, I rule upon the throne. 
Well, we'll be coming to that in a minute as well. And it's in heaven. I opened a door in heaven. Now, if you look on the Ben Ben stone, so called, of Amenemet the third, I think it's the third, in the Cairo Museum, you'll find this glyph here. And what it shows you here, that's the long form hieroglyph which says Sahu or Sah, which means Orion in ancient Egypt. And then you see this little determinative figure of this god who is representing Orion. It's telling you that it's not just um, using it as a word, it's actually describing something definite, this little man holding a star in his hand. And there you see again the Sba or the Stargate hieroglyph. And that's actually, you know, it's, it's not the only place it's sculpted, but it's a good place to start looking uh, for the symbol for Orion, who uh, Orion clearly figured quite importantly, very importantly actually, within the context of the ancient Egyptian religion. And here we see the constellation of Orion. And what we notice here is that you have got the ecliptic, the pathway that the sun follows through the year, moving one degree roughly each day. And it comes right over this upstretched hand, we sometimes call it a club, but you can think of it as a hand, the right hand of Orion reaching up like that to the ecliptic. And where this point is, is exactly on the median plane or the equator of the Milky Way. So it's a crossroads in the sky. And actually, because I'm not sure I'm going to be able to talk to you about this later on, but this line here, running up here, this longitudinal line running through it, marks the point where the sun would be, and then I get this date exactly right, in 2000 AD, but still happening now because it's a fairly slow movement, what's called the precession of the equinoxes. You've heard of this term? Precession of the equinoxes is because the Earth has this slight wobbling gyratory motion. It takes 26,000 uh, years, roughly, to make one rotation. And the, because of that, the day, the first day of spring, moves backwards through the zodiac. Right? And you've heard about it's at the time of Julius Caesar, it would have been still in Aries, I think. And then it's gone back through Pisces. You've heard about the, the age of Aquarius. You know, I haven't got the hair for it anymore, but used to be one of those Aquarius-type people with long hair. Right? <laughs> I expect some of you were as well. Um, the dawning of the age of Aquarius. Well, it's not just the first day of spring that moves backwards. Every other day does as well. And what's particularly important is that the first day of summer, yeah, which is the summer solstice, now takes place when the sun is exactly on that position at the stargate. And that seems to symbolize, because that was the, 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 the Egyptians started their calendar with, with summer. Um, it seems very important that this position here is when the sun is at its highest point actually at the Stargate, and then later on it's going to start going, the, the Stargate will start moving south again. It's been drifting north for the last 13,000 years. 13,000 years ago, that one, you would have had the sun at it at the winter solstice. Now it's at the summer solstice. I call that the omega position, and I call the other one the alpha position. The alpha and the omega this is actually symbolizing the start of the book of Revelation, but that's a whole other lecture, which maybe I might do for you sometime, if you're that interested. But anyway, the northern stargate is there, over the upstretched hand of Orion. And we have this guy, Osiris. You know, the Egyptians had loads of different gods, often had different heads, might be a crocodile or a monkey or something. That didn't mean that they were worshipping, they thought there were crocodile-headed aliens or 
um, monkey-headed aliens or whatever, very often that was just because the people were illiterate. But you pop, you pop the right thing on them and they know who you're talking about. This guy, Azar, is given a green face because, among other things, he's a god of vegetation. And he's associated with bringing wheat or corn to Egypt, teaching them how to uh, grow wheat. So he has a very important role. But the story goes uh, in the uh, Egyptian Book of the Dead, we get glimpses of it, written about in other places, that Osiris came to the earth from the sky, that the earth was in turmoil, people were killing each other, there was awful trouble, the earth was fed up with all this blood pouring out onto her, called out to heaven to God to send her his seed to rescue her. So he sent his son Osiris to, with a, a retinue of other anthropomorphic gods to bring about civilization, to teach the people how to read and write, to teach them to write religious ceremonies, to learn architecture, to do all the good things that are civilized. But as the story goes, where is a good guy is a bad guy. And he had a brother called Set, who's their version of Satan, you could say, who conspired against his brother, murdered him, chopped up his body and scattered the parts along the Nile and took over control of Egypt. Well, Isis, his, his wife and sister, she's actually shown in the background here, this lady here, this, this figure of a hieroglyphic throne uh, means Ast, which is Isis in the Egyptian religion. The other one is her sister Nephthys, who's always shown with this contraption on her head. Doesn't mean they were wearing those things as headdresses, it's just to help you understand who they're talking about. Uh, Isis gathered the parts of the body, put them together again, bound them up with bandages to make the first mummy. Then she approached the god Ra, sun god, got it, tricked him into revealing his magic words, his magic name, and used it to resurrect Osiris. And then, don't ask me how, <laughs> I wasn't there, I didn't see it, but somehow or other she managed to get pregnant by him, and she has a child called Horus. And then Osiris, his work on earth done, goes off to the stars. In fact, he goes to Orion, uh, where he, the, the Sahu figure is his star form. Isis brings up Horus, this, the sun, who, when he reaches manhood, he has a big battle with his uncle, his wicked uncle, sort of Hamlet style, and overthrows him, and he gets control of Horus, uh, of, of Egypt. Thereafter, all the pharaohs of Egypt, while they're alive, they're considered to be incarnations of Horus. And when they die, they become Osirified. And in order to be Osirified, the dead pharaoh has to go through the rituals of being turned into a mummy, being resurrected, his mouth opened, and then symbolically he goes to the stars. Hence the shaft pointing at Orion. Uh, in the Great Pyramid. So that's in a nutshell one of the versions of the story that's told. And here in this, I'll be coming back to this slide, but you can see Osiris sitting here on his throne with his, his two sisters who are, one of them is his wife, perhaps the other one as well. I of Horus is floating up there, sons of Horus on a lotus. And here's another sepulchral ceiling. This is of a pharaoh called Seti I, who I think I'm right in saying was the father of Ramesses II. You've probably heard of Ramesses II. He's the one that um, had all those big statues. Some debate as to whether he actually had them made or whether he just pinched them. But anyway, they all call after him. Seti I, his tomb is in the uh, Valley of the Kings in Luxor. And you can see here, these are called the Deccan gods. Now, the, the Egyptians watched the sky and they watched the rising of stars as a kind of star clock. And they split the sky into 36 
partitions or deckhands, three for each sign of the zodiac, you could say. So there'll be different stars coming over, and when the star's rising, each one it takes 40 minutes. And that, during that 40 minutes, it's the ruler of the sky. So the deckhand gods, their parade is going round and round the sky. But you notice here, we've got our figure of Orion again, and behind him we've got Sirius, and then there's a couple, of, these are a couple of planet gods, they've got hawk heads. Um, so why are they so important? Yeah, all the other decans or whatever, down here they've got sort of narrow bands crowded in, and they, these guys have got all this big space. Well, here's another of these ceilings. This one is the ceiling of Queen Hatshepsut's vizier Senmut. Um, we call him a vizier. He was her architect and probably her lover as well, but we're not absolutely sure of that. Uh, whatever, he had a, um, a mausoleum built right next to her temple at uh, Deir Bakir, is it? Uh, in, on the opposite bank from Luxor. Dalia Albari, I think that's what it's called, where her temple is. Uh, and you can see here the three stars of Orion's belt. There's the figure again of Sahu Orion in his little barge. And there's Sirius. And there's these two hawk headed, um, probably planets, floating along behind. And here we can see in more detail still. You've got the Milky Way, the southern branch here. You've got the Milky Way, the north branch going up here. Now I should tell you that the Milky Way, if you watch the sky, the Milky Way appears to rise and form an archway. And then it goes down again. And then the other side comes up because of the way it's difficult to describe it to you. But you've got to imagine it goes right around the whole star globe. If you have a globe of the stars, Imagine that just as we have an Earth globe, you can think of the whole heavens as being a star globe. And you've got the Milky Way as a great band of stars going all the way around it. Then as the Earth, or it appears to us, the sky twists, but it's really the Earth. So it appears that one arm of this band of stars comes up and then goes down, and the other arm comes up and goes down. And that goes on every day. And we can see here, we have the figure again of Orion in his little boat, and we have Sirius here in her little boat. And I'm going to talk to you about these glyphs up here and what they all mean. But before I do that, here you've got um, Sbit, that's Sbit, which means Sirius, and you've got Ast, the goddess Isis there. So it's telling you that Sirius is associated with the goddess Isis. I'll explain the Orion ones in a second. Now you can see the serious ones there as well. So there you have Sirius, who's Isis, Starfall. And then you have here, that symbolizes Orion. And what's interesting here is they actually put in the dust clouds. And if you've ever looked at Orion or pictures of Orion, especially those wonderful pictures that NASA have have put up. They show you the dust clouds very clearly, or is it glowing plasma, as we would say. Um, but as far as regular astronomy is concerned, there must be some explosions going on in there somewhere and lots of dust being blown around. Um, then we see here, what that means is the upper part of Orion. This is, again, this is the Sahu glyph but it's a sort of abbreviated version. So that says the upper part of Orion, and it's telling us here the family of Horus. There's the family glyph, and here's the hawk Horus. The family of Horus, upper part of Orion. And that says Aret, which literally means mouth or opening. And it's the opening of the star, Literally the Stargate, again, the Aret Spa. 
and it's telling us here the eye of Horus. The eye of Horus is the sun. So it's telling us here the eye of Horus is at the stargate. Well, I just showed you that. And at the moment, that happens when the sun is positioned exactly at the time of midsummer, midsummer's day, 21st of June. Of course, it wasn't when this was all being drawn up. It wouldn't have been the first day of June, but it would still have gone to that position once a year. And then on this side, we've got a repeated glyphs. This is actually not drawn quite right. It should look exactly like that, which means the lower portion of Orion. Now, this upper and lower portion, you've got to think that when Orion rises, it comes up over the eastern horizon. First of all, you get this arm with the shield, and it kind of comes up, and then this shoulder comes up, and then the head and this shoulder, the upper part. And then as it, as it rises, so the legs come up. He's still on his side, isn't he, at that time? Um, and you get the lower portion, the belt, and so on coming up. So you've got the lower portion here, and it tells you, yeah, Osiris. Or set. Osiris. It's in the lower portion of Orion. And it's, it also shows us here, again, the family of Horus as stars. So the family of Horus has now become stars in Orion. And if you read the old um, the, 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 um, pyramid texts from some of the, the pyramids of the 5th and 6th dynasty, they tell us about how the pharaoh is going to become a star in Orion. So <laughs> it fits. These things were not forgotten. This is all New Kingdom stuff. But it's, it's, you'll find it also the same things being said in these Old Kingdom texts too. So, what's going on here? Well, sun god Ra, in Horus form, he takes the son of, of Horus by boat, the sons of Horus by boat, to join Osiris in Orion. Now, in one sense, the sons of Horus, it can be lots of different things. It's, uh, I told you the recension about how Osiris came to earth and you know, with his wife Isis and they had a child after he's dead somehow or other they had a child called Horus that's only one version Horus you'll also read about as being the sky god and you wonder the sky god and they say oh yeah he's a sky god you know he's got two eyes <clears throat> one is the sun and the other is the moon yeah okay and then his planets are sons of Horus What's going on here? And then, and, but the sons of Horus, also, you get these little jars where they used to put the intestines and the lungs and all the gubbins into these jars and they'd bury them with the pharaoh. And they have different kinds of heads on the jars. The baboon and there's a man. Um, well, there's one, I forget what the other ones were, but it doesn't matter. They had these four and they represent four cardinal directions. So what's that all about? Well, I'll tell you what I think it's all about. I think Horus is actually the god of the solar system. And the sons of Hori are us. The sons of Horus, the Hori, are the human race. But we'll come back to that. Anyway, so Ra, in his sun boat, he's taking these sons of Horus, human beings perhaps, souls, to Orion. How does he do that? Well, the sun travels in his bark all the way around the ecliptic, and then one day a year, he's going to be right at the right point of the stargate. They can get out of the boat, and they can go into Orion, proceed down through Orion, down to the belt, and down to, actually, it's the sword of Orion, where the great nebula is, which is where Osiris is supposed to be, where he has his throne. All sounds a bit Christian, doesn't it? Wonder where they got it from. Right, so here you can see Osiris on his throne in Orion. Eye of Horus, the sun, floating in the sky. The eye, remember in those hieroglyphs I told you? The upper part, port, portion of Orion is where the eye of Horus is. And also the sons of Horus in the upper part of Orion. And here we can see his, his sisters, Isis and Nephthys, stand behind him. Well, 
If you look at Orion and you watch its rising, the stars Sirius, who is Isis, and Procyon, who I believe is Nephthys, come up behind Osiris. They, they are the ones who push him up, as it were. They help him to his feet. Leave Egypt for, for a minute. We're now going to cross the Atlantic. We're going to go through thousands of years of history. And we're going to suddenly find ourselves in Mexico <coughs> amidst the Maya. And this is the part of Mexico that interests us particularly. Uh, you can see there's lots of different tribes in other places, but this, this area here, roughly speaking, is where the Maya used to live. Still do live, actually, their descendants. I've met Maya. <laughs> They're still alive today. <laughs> they haven't disappeared. It's only their civilization that disappeared. Now, a very important god for the Maya is a serpent god. You sometimes hear him called Quetzalcoatl or Kukulkan in, in Mayan language. Quetzalcoatl is the Aztec name for him. Uh, but what, what time are we talking about? Well, here gives you a rough chronology. There's, there are archaic civilizations here. I left it all blank because it's all a bit vague what was going on then. But there are obviously things happening long before that. But archaeologists never really want to talk about that. They won't tell you about it. They just say it's archaic. <laughs> right? The bits there, they're interested in go on for about AD 100. And there's various kinds of cultures and things going on. But the ones that we're concerned with are these ones, which are the Mayan civilizations. And you have a Maya old kingdom, and you've got the kind of, which is the classic Maya, which go on here to about 700 AD, something like that, about 100 to 700. Then you get a Maya migration, and you get this kind of late classic period here in the Yucatan, you get civil wars, and you get the coming of the Spanish, and that's the end of it all. And this is in the kind of the late, period after the migrations that we're looking at the temple of Kukulkan. Kukulkan, as I said, being the feathered serpent, um, who's actually a rattlesnake god. But they don't like you talking about that because it's insulting. But you'll see that it is correct. And the four stair stairways in the middle faces of this pyramid, each has 91 steps. 4 times 91, 364. You all knew that, didn't you? Plus one step to get you into the temple, 365. It represents the year. There's nine tiers of bases, and each of the base is faced with blocks which look like snake scales. You can see it better on this picture, the snake scales facing on the, the blocks. It looked like coils of a serpent going round in square format. And this is the balustrade on the northern side. And you can see here, I actually took this picture. If you go there at the equinox, this was actually at the spring equinox, you can see in the afternoon you get the shadow cast by these corners which gives you this undulating wavy serpent figure going down the side of that balustrade. And to do that, they had to position this pyramid exactly right for the sun on that day to perform that, that magic. It might, might work dare to either side of that, but it's set for the equinox. And here's another Mayan uh, city that I visited. This is near Merida also in the Yucatan, uh, a place called Zibil Chaltun. And it faces directly east. So this is what's called a Sac Bay, or White Road. And these, for the Maya, represented the Milky Way in the sky. And here you can see these people walking along towards that temple. But actually, now, again, I was there for this at the spring equinox. 
And had it been, I was there actually at dawn, and had it been a clear sky, we would have seen the sun shining through that gateway on that building there. It's called the House of Dolls. Um, but as you can see, the sky was, was not clear, <laughs> which is very disappointing. But again, this is clearly a solar monument dedicated towards the spring equinox. But as I say, the Cretalus durissus durissus, or rattlesnake, is linked with the August passage of the sun at the zenith. Now, we, because we live in northern latitudes, we're used to, you know, mid, the sun rises, doesn't it, from midwinter to midsummer. It gradually culminates higher and higher in the sky. And it gets up to about that point. And we think, great, you know, we can go on holiday, we can sunbathe, it's wonderful. For the Maya, they live in tropical zone, you know, between the tropics. <coughs> and that means that the sun, there will actually be a time when it, it's moved far enough north to shine directly overhead at noon. And then it may even be, if you're far south enough, that it will carry on going north and you start getting shadows coming the other side at noon. So you, you normally speaking, you will get two days a year when the sun is positioned directly overhead. One is, is generally speaking in May and the other in August. And this one, uh, they, they're mostly interested in the August passage of the sun. Now, I don't know why, but that seemed to be what they were orientating their temples towards. And what's very interesting is that these rattlesnake markings, they, you'll find this throughout the art of the Americas. This, this design, what's called the cane mate pattern, where you have this square with a cross going through it linked up. And you'll find this all over the place. You'll find it on their, their clothing, uh, in the temple layouts, all sorts of places. They're absolutely everywhere. And yet you tell the Mexican archaeologists about this and they'll probably shoot you because it's so insulting to their native culture that you think they worship rattlesnakes. Um, I was told this by a guy called Jose Diaz Belillo, who was, at that time, he was in his 80s and he had worked on this all his life, amazing man. Um, but he showed me about these designs and he actually showed me the snake skins. And here you can see the cane mate pattern being represented. And I, I chose this picture from one of his books because it shows it so clearly, but you'll find it all over the place. And here again at, at Zibil Chaltun, you've got a shadow gnomon. I call it a shadow gnomon, it's actually no shadow gnomon. Um, because there will be a day when the sun casts no shadow when it's at the zenith. So it's directly over that pillar and it casts no shadow because it's directly overhead. And you can see here the steps are in the cardinal direction, the square pl platform oriented north, south, east and west. And there's a 2D representation of the platform, Cane Mate. You can see it as a snake pattern. Yeah. And you'll find these, these, little, um, these little platforms all over the place. I've, there's one in Palenque that I, I saw there, which is quite a long way from here. Um, but you'll find these kind of platforms they did some kind of rituals for, the, for this, sol this day when the sun is directly overhead and they're worshipping the sun god, um, perhaps doing it on that platform. And you can see that this is also one of those platforms. It's just that it's been boosted up. And they've linked it to not just the, sun, the, uh, <coughs> the midsummer day, but also to the equinoxes. It's like a coil rattlesnake. Now I'm going to take you quickly through the divination calendars because I know you all love mathematics here. <laughs> this is how the mayors used to count. They had a vigesimal system, count in twenties. Amazingly, they had a, z a figure for zero, which we didn't have. Am I right in saying 17th century? 
that we started having a zero, which we got from the Arabs, who got it from the Indians. The Indians actually were the ones, I'm talking about India Indians, who, who invented zero, as far as we're concerned. You then count up to f four with dots, and then a five is a dash, and then a six is a dash with a dot, and then you carry on till you've got two dots for 10, and you've got three, three, sorry, two dashes for 10, three dashes for 15, you get up to 19, 20, you're using place, placing then um, shells. They also had names for their days, 20 day names. Khan, Shikan, Kimi, Manik, Lamat, and so on they go up to Achal, Imix, Ik, Achbal. These are all day names. But they like making life complicated for themselves. So, oh, before I go on to that, yeah, the Aztecs also had the same thing. They use the day names they put in, I think it's this ring round here, as the 20 day names. There's a whole load of stuff. You can, if you go on the internet, you'll find a lot of stuff on the Aztec calendar, calendar stone. Um, very interesting, tells you all about this, so I'm not gonna go into it in detail. But what they liked doing was counting the day names against a cycle of 20 days. Sorry, 13 days. And so they would go, whoops, one Imix, two Ik, three Akpal, 13 Bean, etc. And they go on through the counting the day names against these numbers. And of course, because there's 20 day names, you're going to get up to 13 and you're going to go back to one again. And you haven't finished your whole 20 yet. So it's a bit like sort of saying, it's the first of May, Monday, the second, second, two is Tuesday, three is Wednesday, four is Thursday. So you're counting a cycle of seven days against the numbers one to 30. So we do something a bit similar with what we do with our own calendar. And of course, the same name and, and day, number and day name doesn't occur again for 200 till the 261st. So there's 260 to the cycle, which they call a Tzolkin. And that's kind of like a magical calendar. Nobody knows why they wanted to count 13 against 20 and end up with 260. Is it the cycle of some lost planet? Is it because they had 20 toes and 13 something else? Nobody really knows. Some people think it's something to do with rattlesnake teeth. I don't know. But they use that calendar even today as a divination calendar because some days are lucky and others are unlucky. Don't ask me which or which. <laughs> It might be five Kimi or something, it's very unlucky. And four Achau is wonderful. So you want to do your good stuff on one of the good days and sort of hide indoors on one of the bad days. Whatever. But the Maya, you know, they're nothing if uh, they like complication in their lives, so they're not content with that. Um, they also have a 365 day calendar called a Harb. And for that, they have 18 months of 20 days each, which gives you 360, which is not enough. So they have an extra um, short month of five days called Wayeb. And that, I believe, is an unlucky month. You don't, don't do things on those five days. You have a party and you stay indoors. Um, but that gives them 365 days, which is almost right. Now, I had this question, I thought, well, yes, okay, so you've got 365 day calendar, but it's gonna go out of time. You know, we have a leap year, don't we, every four years. We put in an extra day to get the calendar right again. What did they do? Well, I talked to someone about this and they said, well, actually what they used to do is each, each year, they would end a year at a different time of day. So it'd be midnight one year, the next year it would be sort of 6 a.m. and then it'd be midday and 6 p.m. and you're back to midnight. So they put in extra quarter days that way to get around this problem. Ingenious. Anyway, the, they then used to count the 260-day the calendar 
against the 365 day calendar. So you then get what's called a calendar round. You don't get the same uh, two names, one from the 260 and one from the 365 occurring together occurs after 18,980 days, <laughs> uh, which is 52 halves or 73 solkins. So you're f you have 52 years you, to bring that round. It's called a calendar cycle or a sheath of years. And the Aztecs and people like that, they also use the same calendar system. They used to have a big party on the 52 years and they would smash all the china and put out all the fires and have a, a big party and they'd start a new fire in someone's chest and take the fire and spread it round and everybody gets their fire back. They're particularly nasty people. Um, now we're coming to the guts of it, right? Now, all that is just a preparation, right? That's just the Maya having fun with numbers, day names, calendars, confusing everybody else doing things their own way. But they also have a serious calendar. <laughs> this is the serious calendar. Now, and count the days Maya style. So one day is called a kin, which means a sun. Also means a flower, but a sun, a kin. 20 days gives a weenal. It's a sort of short month. And 18 weenals gives a tun, which is uh, not a big barrel. It's 360 days, which is roughly a year without the extra five. And then 20 tons gives a katun, 7,200 days. And actually, they used to put up monuments big stones, carved stones with a picture of the king looking all wonderful in his finery and, and stuff that he's done. And every 20 years they do that, have a katun ceremony. 20 katuns gives a baktun, which is 144,000 days. And 13 baktuns gives an age of the sun, 1,872,000 1, days. That's a big deal. I'll give you, give you an example here. This is something called the Leiden plaque. And it's got glyphs of a king doing stuff on one side, and the other stuff it's got got a date. You can't really see it here, but um, press that. There you are, I can see it better there. And it gives us the date that he's doing all this. Eight back tons, fourteen catons, three tons, one wyab. 12 kittens, and he did something. Let's translate that. So we've got 12 kittens, we've got 20 days, makes up a, a, a weenal, it's only one of those. We've got 3 times 18 times 20, because we've got 3 tons. We've got 14 times 20 times 18 times 20, for the 14 back tons, catons rather. And then we got the eight back tons. And we want to total all that up, gives us that number of days. Which, of course, is no use to you unless you know. <laughs> you need a reference point for the start. <laughs> Otherwise, you can't do anything with it. Or you need a reference point to the end. And very often, they used to count backwards from the end date. They would say, such and such is going to happen then. And before then, so many days before this happened, the king did this, whatever. So when was the start of the present age? Well, there is a, a stela at Quiriga, Quirigua, will that be pronounced? Um, which gives us this date, 13 back tons, zero, 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 zero kins, four ahu, Eight kumku. Those are th those are dates in the other types of calendars, right? That's the Solkin date, and that's um, a Harb date. This is this glyph here tells you Quariga or whatever they called it at the time. 
So when was that? Well, there's something called the Goodman-Martinez-Thompson correlation, derived from comparing known dates in the Gregorian calendar with late dates recorded by the mayor. For instance, the founding of the city of Merida in the Yucatan is recorded in Mayan late date calendars, also recorded by the Spanish. You're able to correlate the two. And there's a few others they were able to use for this. So they found out that the start date was the 12th of August, 3114 BC. <laughs> Which begs the question, if, we weren't, if the Maya only are supposed to have started their civilization around about 100 BC, AD rather, what was going on for the other 3,000 years that they're not supposed to have been civilized? How are they still counting the days? How do they know? Anyway, that's the start of the present age. And what happened at the end of the previous age, according to the Maya? A popol vu tells us. There was a time of crisis in the world which was shrouded with clouds. Most people had perished from cold starvation and a series of natural disasters. Those who survived were in the mountains where they were helped by jaguar gods from the skies. One of the gods gave them fire in return for regular sacrifices of hearts. Hence the start of this whole heart sacrifice business. A pair of jaguar spotted hero twins shot a boastful bird deity from a tree, thereby inaugurating a new age. And the hero twins aided their father, the corn god, in resurrecting from the dead and ascending to heaven which was in the region of Orion. Interesting. And here you can see the hero twins. There's one there and one there. Here's the bird. He's upside down. This guy, he's, he's called Seven Macaw. And he's very boastful. He sits in the tree telling everyone how wonderful he is and what great teeth he's got and how lovely his plumage is, etc. And they shoot him. And here you can see them doing it again. You can see the heroes, either Hun Hunapu or Kibalankwe, his brother, and they've got the Jaguar spots. And here he is with his blowpipe, he shoots him out of the sky. Now notice here the scorpion, representing the constellation of Scorpio. And the tree here, with mirrors on it, and the bird in the tree. And this is very interesting because it's rather similar to Hercules. I don't know if you know the story of Hercules. Um, he rescues Prometheus. Prometheus means able to see ahead. And Prometheus gave fire to the human race against Zeus's orders. And Zeus punished him by having him tied up in the Caucasus Mountains. And every day an eagle would come and peck his liver and every night it would grow back again. And that was to be his torture forever. Well, eventually Hercules came along and rescued him. Now, interestingly, Hercules is a twin. I just threw that in out of interest. But what is interesting here is you've got the scorpion. You've actually got Aquila constellation, which is an a eagle with an arrow through his wing. And you've got Hercules here who's doing the shooting. <laughs> And you've got the Milky Way, like a big tree, running up here. You've also got Sagittarius, who's also a, you know, firing bows, isn't he? So, is there some connection here? It's interesting, anyway. Well, now we'll move to the Maya story of creation. What happened at the start of this age in the creation myth of the Maya? The Maya traditionally have a half where they do all their cooking and stuff on. They have three big stones in a triangle and they put their pot and stuff on top of here to uh, heat up their broth or whatever they're cooking, make their chapatis. I suppose they stick them on the stones themselves. Anyway, they believe that there's a hearth in the sky, three stones, which represent these three stars in Orion and that the sword of Orion represents the fire in the hearthway. Now interestingly, there is the great nebula right there, 
And if you've got sharp eyesight and it's a dark night, you can actually see that with the naked eye. Uh, here is a sky band running, which represents the ecliptic. And you can see two kin signs here. These actually represent eclipses, I think. But the, the turtle dangles down here and he's carrying the hearth stones on his back. Now elsewhere, we'll, the turtle, I think, represents a planet. So are they talking about some planet there? I don't know. But he represents Orion, anyway. So this is where, for the Maya, the place of, of creation begins, in the great nebula of Orion. And the resurrection of the maize god, I told you about First Father, he, he, has a, he gets uh, murdered by the underworld lords on this planet. He comes here, and he's murdered, but he's, he, they cut his head off and hang it in a calabash tree. And one of the daughters of the underground lords is walking past the calabash tree and it, the, the head talks to her and spits in her hand and she becomes pregnant very politely put, I think. Uh, and she gives birth to the two other hero twins. And they're a bit smarter than their dad and his brother were. And they outsmart the, the under, underworld lords and they resurrect their father, who comes out of the, a crack in the shell of the tortoise. And this crack in the shell of the tortoise is what's represented by a ballpark in the Maya and Aztec and other worlds. They're all into this ball game, you know? And I think that this tortoise actually represents the earth, that the shell of the tortoise, or cr the, the partition like that, is like the, um, the continents, you know, split into all these different parts, the continental drift theory and all of that. And you've got two heads on it, which could be the two poles. And First Father, who's the corn god, he comes out of the back of the turtle, and he's resurrected, and he's able to go back to the place of creation, which is Orion. Now we come to another Mayan temple. This is in uh, Palenque. And here, a famous picture, you've probably seen it, Chariots of the Gods. Eric von Daniken reckons that this is a spaceman at the controls of his spaceship. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. I've been there, I've seen it. Uh, here you've got a sky band going round the edge. You've got symbols like there's a sun symbol, there's a moon symbol, there's a Venus symbol there, and here's a couple of stargate symbols. There's one there, and there's another one over here. The crossroads in the sky, where the ecliptic crosses over the median plane of the Milky Way. And then Pakal, this, is, this actually represents Pakal, a man who was buried in the tomb here. He's not a spaceman at all, he's a dead body. Uh, anyway, his soul, he's dressed as first father, the corn god. So he's obviously, just as the Egyptians are dressed up to look like Osiris in his mummy form, they're dressed up to look like the corn god. He's going to be reborn, like the corn god was. And... The Wakachan is a raised up sky tree. And there's a bird deity perched on top of the tree. Now if we look a lot more closely here, here we've got the tree. And you imagine there's a pole going up from the center of the world, or where you're standing. And draped over it is the Milky Way. Now, these teat like pegs they represent stars, and you'll find that in other places in Mayan art. So you've got the Milky Way there, and then you've got the ecliptic crossing over it, and you've got the two crossing points, here are the stargates. One is over the hand of Orion, and the other one is in Sagittarius over the sting of Scorpio. So this is the southern star. You can't see it too clearly here, but you've got the Milky Way there, and this is the one that's the Scorpio Stargate, as I call it. Sorry, you can't see that very clearly. 
Right, so where does this leave us? I've taken you through all this mythology, all this Mayan stuff, weird Egypt stuff, bit of a mess, I know you're thinking what the hell's going on here, why am I here, because I'm a scientist. Uh, well, I think it's quite interesting. First of all, trapezium and the Orion star cluster is where it's all going on for the ancient Egyptians and the Maya. O oh, king, you are this great star, the companion of Orion. It says that in the pyramid texts. King wants to become a star. He wants to go to Orion to become a star. These are very bright stars in trapezium. According to the standard um, cosmology, they're young because they're very big and bright. Electric Universe says no, they're bright because there's a lot of energy flowing through them. Highly, highly electrified area. Very bright stars. Here's Orion. As you would see it, normally speaking, you've got the Milky Way to one side of it, you've got Sirius there, you've got Orion, his belt. This is, the, this is where you find this trapezium down here in the sword. Orion, you've got three belt stars represented by the pyramids. Red giant, Betelgeuse, or is it just that it's not enough energy going through, so it's only red. Uh, very bright star, Rigel, down in the corner there. A lot of energy flowing through it. That's how you normally are taught about Orion. That's how you see it. You look through a telescope. But look through it in a different way, and you start seeing other stuff. Barnard's Loop, for example, running down here. This great loop which can only be seen, it can be seen with the naked eye, but it's an emission nebula. In the red, air, red color, you've got, you've got the Orion Nebula here, you've got another big nebulosity around this star here. Um, and I think this is where there's another nebula down here. <coughs> and then when you start going into the infrared spectrum, my God, the whole thing catches fire. <laughs> Massive streams of energy flowing through here. Just, you know, we can't normally see it because it's, it's uh, in the infrared area of, the, of uh, electromagnetic radiation. And here you can see, in this one, you can see all this filamenting. I'm sorry, these lights are a bit bright, so you can't see it too clearly from where you are, but there's lots of filamenting happening around here, and you can see all these. There's almost a circle around what's his head. There's actually a cluster of stars make up the center of what considered to be the head of Orion. And there's this big circle of influence of something happening there, and you've got Barnard's loop down this side. So what's going on here? Well, we see different parts of the Milky Way galaxy at different times of year. If you imagine here's where the sun is, if we're on this side, we're looking at summertime across here, and we see the summer constellations related to this area, and we can see our way towards the center of the galaxy. In winter time, we're around this side, sorry, around this side, and at night time, we can look out round here, the outer parts. Yeah. Now people have worked out how our galaxy, we, we're looking at our galaxy sideways on, so it's very difficult to work out exactly what's going on. But people have made the attempt and they have worked out there are two major arms. This one is the Sagittarius loop and the other the, the Perseus arm going round here. And it appears that we are in a sub-arm or loop or um, spur called the Orion arm. And we're actually very close to the Orion constellation. Here's our sun, here's Orion. <laughs> Seems like a long way, but it's actually not. All the bright stars that we see in our sky are going to be in this area, obviously. You know, because that's why they're bright, because they're close. Um, and here we can see another. The Orion arm appears to link the two major arms of the galaxy. You've got the Sagittarius arm and the Perseus arm. 
So we've got, uh, this is the Orion arm running down here, linking these two together. So if we imagine, now I'm not an expert on this, uh, other people here I, I know are, um, imagine a galaxy is electrically w working, you know, there's energy, electrons coming in through the arms and going out through the poles and circulating monopole um, motor type system. Well, it could well be that there's a direction of electron flow, kind of short circuit as it were, going through the Orion link between these two arms. It's a very active, well, you know, that, that's the nearest nebula to us is the Orion nebula. Um, is that where we originally came from? I pose that to you. So what happened at the end of the last Maya age? Well, the last age, the age of the Jaguar, began on the 12th of August, 3114 BC. It ended on the 21st, 22nd December, 2012. You heard all about that, I'm sure, at the time. So we're actually living at the beginning of the next age, but is there some kind of overlap, you know? The, the, the ceiling didn't fall down, did it? And the sky didn't fall on our heads. That took place at the winter solstice. In other words, because it took place at the winter solstice, the sun was positioned at the southern stargate, the other one. And the sun was actually very closely aligned towards the center of the galaxy at the end of that age. So it seems to me likely that the Maya kind of knew this was going to come about. And then they dated their calendars backwards from that day. So it wasn't that they had recorded something in 3114 BC. They worked out how many days back when that was going to be. That must be the start of their age, 3114 and then there's other ages before that. <laughs> so will we soon be visited by aliens from Orion? Will they use galactic electricity to get here? In other words, do they not have rocket spaceships, but something more like trams, you know, that run using the wires and get them here from Orion, downwind, down to the Earth, who knows? And that's it. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, Adrian. Brilliant. Very